welcome to our webinar on fundamentals of regulatory design. Um, we have participants from all over the world at this webinar, so I'd like to begin by acknowledging the first peoples from all our countries and pay my respects to them. We honour their wisdom and their stewardship of traditional lands and customs which enrich us all. I'm Rose Webb, Deputy Secretary of Better Regulation Division in New South Wales Department of Customer Service, and I'm also the sponsor of the New South Wales chapter of the National Regulators Community of Practice. And it's my big privilege to be facilitating today's webinar with the legendary Malcolm Sparrow. Um, we don't usually announce the number of registrations for this webinar, but we've broken all records today. We have 1,972 registrations this morning. Um, so Malcolm, even though you've been in Australia and New Zealand numerous times and taught many of our audiences, there seems to be an absolutely inexhaustible appetite to learn from you. I'd just like to start with a bit of housekeeping. Um, any colleagues that missed today or that you'd like to pass on to your um, friends and colleagues, all of the webinars are recorded and available on the Ansel YouTube channel within 14 days. And Malcolm's slides will also be made available. Um, as in previous webinars, we'll be using the Slido app for questions and comments. Um, you can see on the slide the event code, which is R-E-G-D-E-S-I-N-G, -E -E Reg Design. So go to Slido, um, put the code in the browser and ask questions or upvote other people's questions. Um, and Malcolm's very kindly reserved um, almost 30 minutes of today's webinar for those questions. So to introduce the man who needs no introduction, um, Malcolm Sparrow is the Professor of the Practice of Public Management at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University and Faculty Chair of the Executive Program on Strategic Management of Regulatory and Enforcement Agencies. He's the author of nine books, including the recently released Fundamentals of Regulatory Design, which we'll be talking about today. Many of you will have well-thumbed copies of the regulatory craft. I have mine here and the character of Hans on your bookshelves. Professor Sparrow's research interests relate to risk control functions of government and to the special managerial challenges which relate to the roles of social regulation, compliance management, law enforcement and security. So I'd now like to pass over to Malcolm for his presentation. I am really grateful to Anzog uh, for putting this together, for inviting me to do a book talk. I know you don't often do book talks. Uh, I am completely thrilled uh, to be able to hang out with the regulators community of practice, uh, because as far as I can tell, there is no such thing anywhere else on earth. Um, and so the energy that has gone into this and the commitment um, and the cross domain um, learning that you've been able to derive from this, I, th I think is a dream come true. Uh, for 30, more than 30 years, I've been pressing the point in all of my teaching and writing that I think regulators share a huge number of frustrations, a huge number of aspirations, um, that if only they would learn each other's vocabulary, they're dealing with very similar sets of concepts, um, and that there is merit and value in having them share across these lines. Um, you have really done that uh, with a vengeance. Uh, there is the G-Reg movement in New Zealand. Uh, there is no such thing in the United States. Um, and so uh, I am just thrilled uh, at what's happened uh, and to be, uh, be able to share in a little piece of it uh, with you. I should also congratulate, um, particularly those in Melbourne at the completion of 112 days of lockdown and I understand from the news that tomorrow uh, Wednesday is a very special day to you because uh, for you because you can now go to the gym and uh, you can then come home and you can have a barbecue with precisely 10 people because that's what's allowed um, and that this is um, the beginning of life opening up again. Uh, I would just say uh, congratulations, uh, you deserve it. Uh, when from the United States we look at either Australia or New Zealand, um, we look with great envy. Um, we see a level of civicness um, and mutual care um, where you take your personal pain and loss for the sake of a bigger, broader public good and the long term prospects and uh, you deserve the rewards that you get from that. Um, I'm speaking to you from my home, which is in Winchester. That's a suburb of Boston, which is in the state of Massachusetts. For those of you who don't know um, American geography, um, Massachusetts is now approaching 10,000 deaths 
uh, through the pandemic. The country is somewhere in the range 270 to 280,000 deaths and, and the rate is rising and there is no plan. Um, so we have no end in sight. Um, and um, uh, so I take my hat off to you uh, in terms of what you have been able to achieve as a community. Um, I do keep well informed as to what's happening in Australia because I love teaching in Australia and New Zealand. Um, when my last day standing up uh, teaching was March the 13th, it was Friday. Uh, I, it was the last day of my one week program at Harvard. And on January the 13th um, afternoon, Harvard announced that uh, they were going to do what they call de-densification of the campus. That's a new word and it means go home, stay home, everybody. Um, so we've been at home for seven months and a bit now. Um, and uh, the first order of business for me was cancel, cancel, cancel. Um, March, April, May, June, I had four trips booked, uh, two of them to Australia. I had 162 hours of executive level classroom time. Um, that was supposed to happen, all of which got cancelled. And so first two weeks was just cancelling and trying to get refunds out of Qantas. Um, but then I thought, you know, I'll no doubt waste some time and I have wasted a lot of time like many of us. Um, I'm told by the psychologists that's OK and that we should be gentle with ourselves. But I didn't waste all of the time. Um, I thought that, uh, well, in 162 hours I can write a book and I can write down quite a lot of what I would have covered in the core lectures and make that available to all the people that I'm now not going to meet, at least not this year. And so that was really the motivation. It was sort of compensation. I'm sorry we had to cancel the course. I'm sorry we had to cancel the workshop. Um, and in any course or workshop, uh, like the first third is dealing with these fundamental design choices that afflict all regulators. And um, I wanted to get those down on paper in a style that came as close to sitting in the classroom and having a conversation as I could uh, produce. And so it's all very conversational and there's questions and answers. And this is what students normally say, frequently asked questions and exercises um, that give you the opportunity either by yourself or with your peers um, to um, sort of drop these ideas down on your agency and see what what they uh, reveal. Um, I will just say that uh, one of the things I've heard happening in Australia and read it in the news is the launching of another deregulatory agenda. Um, so I had to, I thought, oh no, not again. I thought maybe this is a rerun of the Abbott years, 19, um, 2013 through 15. Um, and so I read the speeches, uh, Morrison and Morton and what they had said about this. And I must say I was comforted. It seems a much more balanced approach than last time around. Uh, they have both started with very clear statements. It is not our intention to weak, weaken the safeguards um, and to endanger the safety of the food and the environment and human health and so on. And at the same time, while we don't want to pr um, reduce protections, uh, there is um, progress to be made in making compliance easier and cheaper and more convenient, uh, more integrated, not du uh, duplicative, not contradictory across different jurisdictional lines. Um, and, you know, and to use the very best of business process engineering and to make it all happen smoother and quicker. And and um, so then I'm comforted and I, I, you know, I remember the arguments we had back in 2014 when the strident message was uh, better business, better business, better business. And in order to persuade regulators to engage constructively with that agenda, um, I said, well, every time somebody says better business, you better say yes, better business. We believe in that too. And better protection at the same time. And that you would always put these two things together in the same sentence, better business environment and better protection for the public at the same time. So it's not political, just more or less. It's not one wins and the other loses. It's a Pareto improvement on both fronts simultaneously. And that gets close to being um, apolitical. 
um, and it's of course much more intellectually challenging how to achieve it. But it does comfort regulators um, in that you can uh, engage constructively with such an agenda with knowing full well that you are not compromising your mission, your protective mission, uh, one jot. So I hope that however this plays out, and I'll be watching closely, um, uh, that it turns into a thoroughly constructive uh, business. Um, yes, I'm supposed to talk about the book. I don't normally do book talks. Uh, I hate them. Um, I'm a British introvert, and so we normally spend half of our lives apologizing for our mere existence and getting into other people's way. Certainly don't aggressively promote uh, either ourselves or our, our products. Um, but uh, the opportunity to talk about it to this crew, um, I really couldn't resist. And Monica, as many of you know, can be quite persuasive about such a thing. So I will tell you um, what I need to tell you about the book. Um, I'm hoping that my slides are now showing, yes, and that we can uh, progress. So this is the front cover. Um, and um, uh, what is it about? Um, well, design choices, um, why do you need to worry about organizational design? Uh, the un simple answer why we have the field of organizational theory um, is you need a theory every time there's a job that's too big for one person. If you have a one person sized job, you don't need organizational theory. Just do it yourself, all of it. But if it's a huge labor, um, and you've got a thousand people and you've got to set up divisions and units and maybe processes. Um, then there's the whole puzzle about how you split up the work and hand it out and get it done um, in the most efficient manner. And we've got a number of different organizational theories operating inside most established regulatory agencies. Functional work is well known. Process work is well known. Problem based work is coming along. Um, albeit not quite as mature as the other two still. Um, there's also crisis response to be done, which puts everything else on hold, as you have recently discovered. Um, and there's all kinds of questions about which parts of your harm reduction mission you can safely delegate to the industry and under what circumstances. So this book uh, covers um, in sort of lecture conversational style, um, five of these underlying dimensions of choice um, that won't be a surprise to anyone who's either done the ENSOG course or been to one of my introductory uh, seminars. And I'm not going to teach you through all of these things. We surely don't have time today. Um, but chapter one is about um, the well-known distinction between uh, focusing on the rules, um, the legal model, or focusing on the risks, uh, the expert model. Um, and uh, you obviously deal first with the overlap. And if you dare to stray into the remaining crescents, there, there's jeopardy of different types. If you work on the left, they might say you're obsolete, unreasonable, and nitpicky, and there's really no risk attached. And they'll probably launch a, a deregulatory um, agenda in your honor. Um, if you go over to the right, which seems to be where most agencies want to go these days, um, there's always the concern that it's unauthorized and mission creep and you're straying outside your statutory limits. Chapter one explores this tension, which has been with us ever since we've had democratic governments on Earth and will be with us all the time that they remain. So this is constant tension. It will never go away. Um, my observation uh, these days is that most agencies are already operating in the expert domain. Um, with an emphasis on uh, vigilance, uh, spotting new and emerging problems not yet recognized in law, learning how to organize around them, um, telling a story in terms of um, the risks identified and treated rather than the litany of um, compliance statistics. So that's what the first chapter is about. Second one looks at the fundamental distinction between uh, his good things on the right and bad things on the left. I think this is absolutely fundamental to the risk control business, even though it's not really much discussed in the risk literature. Um, I believe that these are, um, at the end of the day, quite different operations. On the right, you tend to have big um, positive promotion programs. 
with a very broad reach. They're often quite permanent, like we teach wellness um, for the sake of helping people protect their own health. Uh, but on the left, you've got a more careful, um, tighter focus on smaller pockets of harm and misery, the, the identification of them, the pattern recognition that goes with that, um, recognizing that a lot of them are one-offs and unique, um, and that you need to think through each one um, uh, to produce a tailor-made response. And it, just that these are two entirely different types of operation which have to exist or coexist now inside one regulatory agency. And um, chapter two talks about um, how you would know if the balance was off and what the um, integration of these different methods would actually uh, feel like. It also talks a little bit about, you know, even once you've designed your agency, um, the language that you choose to use um, affects your political communication strategy. And also um, the language that you choose to use in persuading people to behave one way, informed by behavioral economics and nudge theory and so on, that also can either impose guilt for doing wrong or it can heap praise and positive incentives on people for doing uh, the right thing. We can learn a lot about which one works better. So several aspects to that. The third chapter is about the emergence of craftsmanship, um, which of course is fully described in the regulatory craft, but that's a more academic book. Um, the emergence of craftsmanship undoes the evils of the swinging regulatory pendulum back and forth. It also gets rid of camps um, or ideological preferences which are based on tools and replaces it with this idea that no, we, we agree the ends but we don't ever decide which tools are valuable in general. We only decide that when we know what the task is, what we're working on, who the players are, what are their motivations, what are their competences, and then we can figure out the right approach to take with that particular uh, problem. And the same is a, the same sort of versatility, um, I think should be applied to regulatory style. And this is a bit of a surprise to people. I would also argue that the same versatility needs to be available when it comes to choosing between reactive, preventive, and proactive uh, strategies. Some people say, oh, prevention is always better than a cure, um, but that's simply not true. <laughs> Sometimes it's not possible and you have to look for early detection, um, like uh, the way the health system mostly deals with cancer early detection so that we can cure it before it becomes fatal, but it's still nevertheless detection. It's not prevention that happens in other domains. Um, so that's what chapter three is about. It's connected, of course, to chapter four. Many of you have seen this picture. Um, you have a general obligation to control a class of harms. They're big, huge and general, and they're in the outside world. Um, and what we're quite used to doing is building a theory that tells us which major programs to produce. And these are functional programs like an audit program, an inspection program, an investigation program, a partnership program, an education program. Um, and then we hand out the work to the field. And so what happens out in the field is the result of schedules set on a program basis. Um, there are also process based programs where we do registrations and licenses and determination of fit for purpose and we process tax returns and oil spills and 911 calls. Um, and we're good at all of these things because we've been doing them a long time. That's the program centered method and uh, what's emerging in many agencies. Um, lots of people working on it in Australia and New Zealand is um, Never mind what we would normally do, let's look more carefully at the risks and identify the specific elements, learn how to organize around those so that we can grapple with them intelligently. Um, this is this picture I drew in 1998. Um, I haven't changed it in 22 years, except to change the title um, because this title is simpler and plainer than the one that I had before. Um, but this is still um, important work that's being done in a great many regulatory agencies. I didn't invent it, I merely observe it. Um, I try and codify exactly what it is and formalize it in a way so that we can present it to others and they can move quicker on this front if they want. 
But chapter four talks about this um, persistent dilemma, how much problem centric work to do versus how much program centric work. And if you do both at a reasonable level, then what on earth is the um, relationship between them, the integrative arrangement, so where one informs the other, um, and uh, rather than simply competing for time, attention and resources. Um, and then uh, many of you will have seen this picture before. I don't propose to talk you through it. Um, uh, this is about which parts of the risk management job crudely here divided into spotting the risk, figuring it out and then acting. Uh, which parts we should delegate to industry and under what circumstances. And then, of course, there's all kinds of labels that internationally get applied to these various uh, distributions. Um, and uh, what, this is actually now the most substantial chapter in the uh, new book um, because it's not covered at all in either the regulatory craft or the character of harms. And it seems to be, I think, where we're heading towards an awful lot of trouble. Uh, we still have a political preferences in some countries that say model three is best. We should have a light touch, trusting, self-regulatory approach and that that's normal, that's modern, and that anything else is old hat and should be forgotten, written off as history. So um, I take you through the analysis in the chapter. Hold on a minute. Well, when would model three work? Well, when would it be trustworthy? And the answer is obvious for things that they can see, that they're happy to report to you, that they're interested in controlling, and it's in their capabilities to control. You're trusting them to do the whole job under periodic audit. So it has to be something they want to do and something that they're capable of doing. And that turns out in many cases to be a relatively small subset of all of the risks that we should be worrying about. Um, and so you then have to go on and ask the question is, well, if you're trusting model three in general, uh, which are the risks um, that you should now worry about? Because you can't trust this model for them. And if you can't trust this model for them, then which other model do you need to turn back to? Or what other ancillary protections do you need to put in place um, in order to round out uh, your performance? Now, I know that um, with the RCOP audience, uh, many of you have seen all of these pictures before, um, and you might therefore properly conclude you do not need this new book. And that's uh, perfectly fine with me if that's what you conclude. Um, although I would say you probably know somebody else that does need it because they haven't done the course and that you'd like to be able to have all of these conversations with them. Or maybe you just like a refresher and an update and then this will do uh, that for you too. So uh, that's what uh, the book is about. Um, I will just uh, mention um, a strange difficulty that Australians will have getting hold of the paperback. Um, I, uh, when I thought I would write this, I approached my favourite publishers, which were Cambridge University Press and Brookings, and they both expressed some interest. But uh, neither one of them could have had the book out until um, the summer of next year, by which time I'm assuming the pandemic is probably over by then. And this, the whole point here is, is to make this available for people that want to curl up with the dog in their sofa and um, make up for uh, lectures, conferences um, or courses that they might otherwise have taken. So I published it myself, uh, which is a very interesting experience through Amazon and Kindle Direct Publishing. Um, and uh, there is a page on my website that I want to show you how to get to. If you go to my main page through whatever route, all you need to do then is click on the image of the book top left, and that will take you to the proper page, which is all about the book. Um, it, of course, describes it, um, but it offers you a couple of other things that I think you will find convenient. Um, one of them is it points out that each chapter uh, contains a selection of frequently asked questions that sort of emulates ordinary classroom discussion, um, but also includes the diagnostic exercise at the end of the chapter, um, which you could use uh, perhaps by yourself or perhaps with colleagues if you're going to do a book group. Um, to effectively drop this idea, um, this dimension down on your agency and see what it uh, reveals. 
And there is a downloadable Word document here for free, of course, uh, which contains the whole set of diagnostic exercises, all five chapters, um, as a template that you can just take away and um, uh, use it um, to guide your own exploration. I have now used this book once in my Harvard course and just had the students work privately on their own template here to make sure that they really took the time to think through the consequences of these choices for their own agency. That's uh, all I uh, wanted to tell you. Very happy to um, take questions about the book or about uh, life here in Massachusetts or um, uh, anything else that you'd like to tell me to cheer me up. <laughs> I, I will vicariously enjoy uh, tomorrow uh, with you all in uh, Victoria. Thanks very much, Malcolm. And um, we do have some questions coming through and we did have some discussion on the Slido about Amazon. So it was very helpful that you cleared all that up for people. Hopefully that's explained to people why they might have been having some issues. Yeah. Um, we do have questions and most of them are about regulation. So um, we'll see if we get any COVID ones later. But the first one that's a very popular one is about the use of technology and regulation. Um, it says, how can we use it in the absence of human resources? But I think we'd all be interested how we can use it even if we do have human resources as well. Um, OK, so and I don't know, are you thinking specifically, um, maybe they mentioned RegTech? Um, I very, think that's the, the phrase of the moment, yes. It's a very uh, fashionable thing and, it, and uh, it's one of those, because it's fashionable, it's not entirely clearly defined and there's a huge range of ideas lurking under the surface, including big data and artificial intelligence and better pattern recognition and digital surveillance and the use of drones <laughs> and, and a whole bunch of other uh, very use, potentially useful technologies coming along in the regulatory world. Um, I confess I am not an expert in the AI and big data side of this. Um, but, uh, and I do get asked, uh, I was asked by the Dutch uh, for my views on uh, RegTech and the importance of innovation. Um, I'm actually, uh, there is another academic subject called um, innovation, the study of innovations and innovativeness. Um, and a lot of people assume if I cared about the future of uh, regulation, then I'd surely be all into um, the science of innovation and innovativeness, including technical innovation in this case. And I would say, well, yes, I am, of course, um, but never for their own sake. Um, and I think there is a danger. Um, a lot of what the uh, academics who study innovations do is try to identify important innovations, step one. Then two, uh, think about diffusion and how we can get more people to adopt this one technical innovation. Um, and then three, how we can measure um, innovativeness at the agency level um, according to how good they are at accommodating and then maturing with these new ideas. Um, now, all of that's good, uh, but it's actually sort of driven by your sense of what is the innovation and how, which three am I going to focus on? And my instinct is just a bit different from that uh, because I um, talk about the value of craftsmanship. Um, I want to focus on the tasks first. Um, and derive from the nature of tasks that I confront, my understanding about the need for new tools. I'm not sure I want to uh, pursue or experiment a lot. I mean, a little is always useful, but a lot with tools for which I have no obvious use right now, and certainly not for their own sake. So the important test is always, does it make the regulator more efficient or does it make the regulator uh, more effective? Um, or does it make them more accurate, more targeted, more focused? All of those things, all perfectly good. Um, but I'm a little leery of uh, the focus on innovations for their own sake. And my, um, what I will always say to the reg tech people is, it's great that you're teaching us about all of these opportunities, but are we clear how and where and why uh, regulators uh, can accommodate them and use them quickly? And in a very practical sense, um, let's not do them for their own sake. That's my that's my reaction. I guess so just a quick follow up to that one. Have you seen it sort of done really well somewhere or got an example where people well, have, have used technology uh, well? I was talking, actually I interviewed uh, for my class at Harvard. Um, I had one of my former students from Amsterdam who, who actually is known to uh, many of your folks, uh, Hanzo van Boisekom. He's now the chairman of the board. 
at the AFM. So be careful, folks. That's what happens when you come on my course. Uh, you know, 16 years later, he's the chairman. Um, and I said, uh, you know, I don't really know much about um, the surveillance of financial markets, uh, but you're all working from home, right? And he said, yeah, we're all working from home. Uh, I said, well, how would, you know, have you discovered how you can do your job working from home? Um, and he said, well, it's actually a bit of a surprise when we started looking uh, at the major markets that we're supposed to, and exchanges that we are monitoring, and we realized we couldn't go to the buildings and conduct a normal audit. Um, the regulated entity said, well, it's probably just as well because there's nobody there. Um, and the, the one major exchange they had, I think they had three people in the building uh, last time he talked to them, probably caretakers. He said that the whole system is running uh, in cyber uh, space anyway. And so for us regulators to have to run in cyberspace, we're just catching up with them. Um, and it's actually a, a, a wonderful opportunity, I think, to be pushed into uh, how to catch up with a world that has already gone um, uh, so much uh, virtual. Um, and uh, there are uh, very clear opportunities once you're in cyberspace and everything is digital. Um, you can run kind of pattern recognition uh, systems and um, surveillance operations that you you couldn't have done in a paper environment, um, nor would you probably have done in the context of visits and audits and inspections. Um, so yes, it's wake up time uh, for the uh, opportunities that are presented by um, virtual monitoring and surveillance. So that flows a little bit into our next question is, which is what is the most interesting or surprising regulatory development that you've observed during COVID? Uh, I don't know whether they mean a positive one. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't specify. 17 people are interested in the answer so far. So. Yeah, I, I have. Um, well, uh, being in the US, of course, I've been horrified by the um, regulatory uh, or apparent control failures. Uh, our hope in the states is that the regulatory agencies that count, like Food and Drug Administration, Health Services and so on, when it actually comes to making scientific judgments that we're all eager for, on uh, therapies and vaccines um, that they won't allow anything to bias them from their normal um, quality standards. What we do want, of course, is accelerated process time. Um, and actually, I, I think I heard the Morrison government also saying we do need accelerated uh, testing and treatment, of course, um, but without any compromise on, on uh, quality. Um, I. I'm not an epidemiologist, and so I, you know, I, I haven't put myself forward on the uh, policy on COVID. I do think it's actually um, for anyone interested in risk management. Um, it's a fascinating uh, puzzle. If you put it, if there's any, you know, political drift that says, oh, we're either pro the economy or we're pro human health. Well, forget that. Um, that's just silliness. Um, what you're trying to do, um, I, I, I picture it as trying to mesh two different surfaces. Um, you have economic uh, life that you'd like to restore um, as much as possible, and but then you don't want it um, restored so much that it starts hitting what you could call the risk surface um, and starts endangering vulnerable people or transmitting too fast through certain activities. Um, and I did have discussion with um, some of my colleagues about what what is the dimensionality of this problem. Um, and I think I can make the case it's, a, it's these two surfaces that you're trying to push together and squeeze the air out of, but without them actually touching each other, are four dimensional. Um, what you want to know is who can do what, where, uh, and with what controls, who, uh, you know, vulnerable classes um, just stay home. Um, some people much more resilient than others, kids um, quite different from grandparents. Can do what? What kind of activities can we engage in? Open air rallies or indoor um, or swimming in a lane uh, six feet apart or playing tennis, uh, which I do. That's, of course, the safe one, social distancing, but quite different from playing chess or backgammon, a bridge, um, who can do what, uh, where, um, 
any kind of um, calculation on exposure is affected by the underlying infection rate, which is regionally variant. Um, and uh, with what controls, um, if you do it with a plexiglass shield or not, or wearing face coverings or not, or in the outdoors or not, um, then a lot of things otherwise dangerous become much safer. Um, and so, you know, you're looking for policymakers uh, to begin to understand the textured nature of this matching problem. Um, and I think the more and more they did understand the multidimensional nature of it, um, the closer we'd be able to get these surfaces, uh, which would mean more economic activity um, without um, any greater uh, danger. Um, and, uh, I, I, you know, I just, as a mathematician, I'm itching to see the um, more textured and nuanced versions of that calculation bubbling their way up through public policy formulas. It's happening for sure. Um, but but it's, it's confounded by the fact um, that however complex your model turns out to be, you have to communicate it clearly and simply to the public. Um, and on this front, I've watched the UK. Um, the government has, um, you know, constantly adapted and claims to be learning and using multiple dimensions and different regional approaches. And, and the more texture they get, <laughs> the more they get panned um, because people can't keep up and don't understand. So, so at the same time, you need these sort of color coded models that make everything plain to everyone. Yeah, it's. Um, I think there's going to be some fascinating case studies to be written. Um, here in my team, we've had to sort of turn all our safe work, um, fair trading, liquor and gaming inspectors into public health inspectors overnight because yes. they've been doing some of this work and exactly what you're saying about the challenge of complex health orders. How do you yes. get that to be meaningful for people who are just trying to operate their business in a safe mm. way? And so really mm. interesting question. Um, the next question is from Eric, but there's quite a few people who are also interested. It says, is there a really a point in focusing on regulatory design when political imperatives are often the drivers for regulation and its design. So slightly cynical view there. I don't know. I don't think it's cynical. I, I'd say it's appropriately democratic. Um, we are uh, in democracies, uh, pretty much all of us on this call. Um, and uh, the executive agencies therefore have an obligation to listen to the wishes of their political masters. Um, on occasions, of course, you feel that the political masters aren't experts, um, don't know as much as you do, um, and perhaps are driven by a whole set of incentives or imperatives that you don't entirely approve of. Um, but nevertheless, you do have an obligation to make democracy work, um, and that means to be relatively straightforward and accountable to them. Um, and um, uh, I think it means two things for the uh, professional regulator. One, you have an education role facing upwards. Um, when people come into political office, they've often not governed a regulatory agency before. They really don't know uh, the nuances of your business. Um, I, uh, I, I had a very good friend. Uh, he's now retired from US Federal Service. Uh, his name was Michael Stahl, and he was the head of enforcement at the uh, US Environmental Protection Agency for many, many years. Um, and he was there as the senior uh, career official while many uh, assistant um, administrators came and went. So he saw a whole bunch of different political people, his immediate boss. Um, and and he, I was talking to him one day about how you manage the boundary between the senior ranks of the executive service from the junior ranks of the political spectrum. Um, and he said, well, actually, they're very needy. Uh, these are generally very needy people when they come into office. And what he, what he learned to do when a new one was coming was to sort of go to their home the week before and say, um, I don't know if you've considered, you know, what you'd like to be able to announce on your first day, because people are going to ask you what you plan to do. And I thought it might be useful. I've laid out uh, 20 options for you here. Um, all of which would be perfectly plausible given the history of the agency. And, and if you want to know my recommendations, it would be numbers one, four and seven. But, you know, it's, it's got to be your choice. Um, and he, he said they, they were unbelievably relieved and grateful um, to be taking this advice, you know, very diplomatically couched, of course. 
um, and uh, then to make it their agenda. It needs to be their agenda. That's one of their um, uh, needs uh, politically and, and career wise. Um, in my, so there, there are opportunities to um, uh, correct, to inform, um, to educate, um, and if you do it in the right manner, um, it makes life so much easier for everybody. Um, the other thing is the whole business of political management. A lot of, um, I'm not sure that in schools of government or certainly in business schools, we don't teach very much about political management. Um, and if I have a class of executives, um, you know, in my Harvard program or the MREC program in Australia, um, you've got 80 people in the room. If I say uh, who in this class regards themselves as expert at analysis, um, we'll get 10 hands going up. Who, who regards uh, yourselves as experts in uh, regulatory law? 15 hands will go up. Who regards uh, yourself as expert in uh, human resource management, fewer in my class typically, but four or five. Who regards yourself as expert in political management? No one. Occasionally one. <laughs> and that's usually the person that's come as a staffer to a senator, and it's their life. They're not really in a regulatory agency. So, and it's stunning when no one claims to be good at or excellent at political management because it de we depend on it so much. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think uh, vigorous and energetic diplomatic engagement is, um, is, is, you know, one of those skills of the head of an agency. Some people just have it. Um, a lot of people don't and get frustrated by it. And I'm not sure that we do enough to teach it um, and to train people for that aspect of the executive roles. Great, thank you. Um, next question comes from Kate and she's asking, are there any clear indicators that can identify that we may be regulating a sector or an industry or an activity using the wrong model? Ooh, well then you, uh, Kate must read chapter five <laughs> and then email me and did that sort it out um, or not? Uh, actually, I, I think that there's pretty clear uh, criteria. I won't pull up the chart again. Um, but what it's um, the progression from left to right uh, on those models um, is sort of driven mostly by history and political fashions. You know, we always used to be model one, what you call black letter law, prescriptive rule based regulation. Um, and then greater flexibility was required um, over means, even if you still govern the ends or the goals, um, because there was technical innovation, there was wide diversity in industry, we needed to accommodate those things quicker. And so then we invent performance based regulation and that becomes flavor and not, not flavor of the month, but flavor of the decade um, by about um, the late 1990s, um, early 2000s. Um, but then um, in high hazard in industries, they say, well, hold on a minute, we got the experts, we invented nanotechnology and bioengineering and, and credit default swaps, complex derivative instruments. You know, who are you, the regulator, to understand those things? Why don't you let us spot the risks? We know them better than you do. And then, then you're in the realm model three of self-regulation. And this is a sort of historical progression from left to right. Um, and if we do this discussion in class uh, with mixed regulators, um, part of the apply to your own agency is, first of all, figure out which models do you do you operate? Um, and the normal answer is uh, more than one. We're actually operating at least two of these models simultaneously, sometimes three. Um, and in that case, I said, well, you know, how does that come about that you've decided to operate more than one of these models simultaneously? Is that to give you versatility? And they say, no, 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 that's that's history. We had this job back in the 1980s, and so that's prescriptive regulation. Then we got a new piece of jurisdiction added on. By then, everyone was talking performance based regulation. So that's how we govern that one. And then uh, come along 2008, we had our latest edition, and by then we've got the better regulation movement rumbling through the OECD um, saying we need a light touch trusting self-regulatory model, whether you do call it SMS 
or not, depending on what industry you're in. And so you see these different models emerging, not because they're right for the risks, but because it's fashionable at the time you acquired that responsibility. And that to me is incredibly dangerous. Um, and so to Kate, I would say, forget the history. Now look at the risks and ask yourself these um, key positioning questions. For this class of risks, who is best placed to see it? With data that they have, with analysis that they know how to do and are likely to conduct. And if it's a company, but you're talking about, you know, structural weaknesses in the financial system or air traffic congestion or something that's way above their level, they can't see that. Or even if you're looking at an investment bank saying, you know, talk, talk to me about uh, potential um, uh, failure in, in financial markets, they can't see that. They can only see their stuff. Um, and so you need the higher level view and that's the right and obvious and logical answer to the question. Government needs to be watching things that they can't see or that they wouldn't see because they wouldn't do the analysis. Um, and then once you've seen the risk, it doesn't mean that that's where everything else takes place. Then ask the question, OK, now we know about this class of risks. Who is best placed to figure out a response, to figure out the response? Um, and you might decide to go a lot more local or devolved in figuring it out because there could be in different climates and there could be different business conditions. You might have dense urban and, and uh, uh, rural um, and communities, quite different um, methods would be appropriate. Um, and so you might choose to allow a lot more responsiveness at a lower level. And then of course, who's going to carry out the plan? <laughs> there's things they can do, there's things we can do. Uh, these are not difficult questions. Um, but the key is to ask them systematically and in order, not about industries and not about companies, but about risks. Because same industry, same company, different risks, you'll get different answers. Um, and that's part of the trick to knowing, you know, which of these models is actually um, good, good for which things. So, so um, I, I, I've answered, I think it was Kate's question backwards, uh, rather than saying, how do you know when you got it wrong? <laughs> First of all, run through the exercise of figuring out what would be right and then seeing yeah. if what you have is pure history and tradition rather than the correct answer. Next question is from Andrew, who has outed himself as coming from um, ACMA, the Communications and Media Authority. Um, mm. He asks whether you have any guidance on appropriate size and scope for regulators. When is it best to have large, broad regulators versus small focused regulators? You mean in terms of the um, organisation? I think that's right. Yeah, should they have many regulatory responsibilities or should they be a specialist agency? Heavens. <laughs> is there is there uh, an easy answer to that one? Well, there's a there's an inter, there's an observation from an outsider. Um, Australia is remarkably good at um, popping duties up and then down again, um, from the states and territories to the Commonwealth level, and then three years later deciding, oh no, it would be better to do it back at the state level. So so you have a lot of. Um, changes in structures going on um, surprisingly frequently. Um, that doesn't happen so much in the States. Um, and you have uh, quite fashionable these days is mergers and acquisitions amongst regulators when they get shoved together, um, usually because somebody's interested in um, efficiency. Um, and that's a perfectly reasonable argument. Um, another one, of course, is that uh, you it would be nice to have a single point of contact for industry rather than to be dealing with one regulator is probably easier for them than to be dealing with six. Um, curiously, given RegTech and modern technology, um, I think the need to actually merge agencies is less lessened because you can use fancy things like client facing web portals where the regulated only has to write their name and address once when they want to make an application and and the portal then splits up all the information and sends it off to who are all, all the regulators that they need to be confronting and maybe there's even an attempt to coordinate the responses so they get all their permits in one fell swoop wouldn't that be nice um, you can do more of that with technology um, and without actually merging um, the agencies. Um, the, 
Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I guess the simple answer is, does the structure that you're proposing make more sense given the structure of the industry that you're regulating? Yeah, thank you. Um, and interestingly, that's the conversation we're having right at the moment in New South Wales about, you know, is it the regulatory platform that we should be syncing together rather than trying to just merge a whole lot of regulatory functions? Um, so well, well, in New South Wales, you, you have the, the, the new customer service organisation. Which, has, um, I, yeah, which is I tell government what's it's, it's an amazing array mm -hmm. of different things brought together um, and uh, potentially confusing. Um, some of them are regulatory functions and many of them are not. No. Um, so you've got quite a lot of um, you know infrastructure, transportation services, uh, all kinds of things being provided for citizens in New South Wales and a whole bunch of regulatory functions like liquor and gaming all put in the same under the same basic frame, uh, you absolutely have to take care yeah. of the danger um, yeah. that we won't distinguish adequately regulatory functions from service functions. Yeah. And as long as you can take care of that danger, you know, the citizens of New South Wales <laughs> will probably benefit. Get their fishing license and their um, their driver's license in one hit. But what, yes, and what we're looking at is, you know, is, the, is what's happening on the background, you know, able to make the most of that customer facing part, but as you say, keep the regulatory responsibility and specialty happening. And, and also yeah. be aware of the danger that um, just the naming of the overall department um, <laughs> is potentially confusing for people with a regulatory mission. You're not in the customer service business, no. even if you happen to be in a customer service organization. Uh, speaking language very dear to my heart, but we won't go into all of that. <laughs> My, my daily struggle. Um, we'll go back to the questions that we've got from um, the people online. Um, I think this one follows your, your mention of our dereg agenda. Um, how should regulatory practitioners deal with a deregulatory agenda, which is really an anti-regulatory agenda? Um, I think that you should do take it, seize every opportunity to um, state both purposes. Um, yes, well, I agree with you. Of course, we want better business, but we also need better protections. And, I, and I'm not going to compromise that uh, for the sake of a better um, uh, better business. Um, I, I, I would I actually use the analogy of a um, sailor. I'm not much of a sailor, but I'm sure many of you are. Um, and uh, when you go out in your boat, um, there's all kinds of things going on. Um, there's a swell pattern on the surface of the water. You don't really know where it came from, but it has a direction and a magnitude. Um, and there's a, a wind blowing in a particular direction and more or less turbulent. Um, and there's um, a current running under the water. Um, and there's probably a surface wave pattern, which is often wind driven or other boats wakes or all kinds of other things. And so you've got all of this sort of environmental stuff going on. What do you do? when you want to get from point A to point B, and the answer is you set your sails and your rudder to make use of all of these forces which are around to get you from A to B. So rather than just sitting there and feeling buffeted by political winds that might blow through, um, I'm always urging regulators to be very clear where you want to be six months from now and what use can you make of this particular wind? Um, and if they're only talking about cleaning out regulation, well, take the opportunity to clean out your obsolete and redundant uh, regulation, um, but don't allow it, of course, to compromise your mission and don't um, put away anything valuable. Uh, think like a sailor is the best advice I can give. Uh, if you don't like the winds that are blowing, make use of them. Great, and I think we've got time for just one more quick question. I can tell you there's hundreds here, so I do apologise to everyone that we haven't had time to get to many of them. This yeah. one is from Ali, and it's just what are the key capabilities regulators should invest in to continue to problem solve in the future? Ooh, uh, and how many words do I have for that? I think you've got a minute. <laughs> I give you five words. Um, be vigilant be nimble and be skillful. And then if you want to know what your performance account should look like when it's not just, you know, a set of KPIs and compliance statistics, demonstrate in your performance report how vigilant you were, 
how nimble you were. That means organizing around things that don't necessarily fit. You've got to be a bit artful and crafty how you set yourself up and skillful that you experiment and find solutions that actually work and you can demonstrate impact on problems that count. Be vigilant, um, nimble and skillful. I actually wrote that for the first time ever. Uh, I see that you've got uh, Femke de Vries um, coming to visit the community soon. Um, she worked at the Dutch Central Bank. I met her there and later at AFM. Um, and uh, after the global financial crisis, she decided to put together a book on uh, the way the financial regulation had changed and all the things that we needed to be doing, not only a better job of prevention, but in the wake of the scandal. And she asked me to write the forward for that book, which I did. Um, and th that's the place that I said, well, that's, uh, and she already had all the chapters written by different authors. So I sort of scoured through them and picked out the central themes. And these were the central themes that seemed to come out um, that needed highlighting. Vigilance to be able to anticipate um, and get ahead of uh, emerging risks, um, nimbleness so that we're not just stuck uh, with things that we don't know how to organize around and skill, which of course involves innovation and experimentation and the willingness to try uh, things you've never done before. Thanks so much, Malcolm. As I said, I think we've got enough questions to go for another hour, but hopefully one day you'll be back here in Australia and we can um, talk longer and directly with you, but it's been absolutely fantastic. Um, really appreciate the time that you've given to us.